this is a big exciting moment for me because I can't remember the last time I had 10 people in class. Uh, the world is a strange, strange place these days. Anyway, what I want to talk about today is uh, language, if I can spell it. So, um, language. We've all seen the word. We all know what language is in a general sense. So why on earth are we going to talk about it in this class? Why on earth are we bringing it up? Any guesses or any thoughts on this? What is it that about this class that means that language is a topic that's worth bringing up? Maybe that it changes the meaning of what you say. Yeah, so here's the key. It's not just that it changes the meaning of what you say. What's the main way that we human beings communicate? What is our main way of expressing meanings? Well, we use language. In fact, this entire semester, I've been generally, I mean, I've given you lots and lots of arguments with premises and conclusions, but I haven't just like, I, I can't totally mind read. I can't control your head. Instead, how do I get you to realize what the argument that we're talking about is? How do I get you to think about it? How do I get you to even know what I'm talking about? Well, I write out the sentences on the board. I use language to get the ideas across. So the basic reason that we're talking about language is that the nature of human beings as a creature, the main way we talk and the main way we interact and the main way we convince each other of things is using language. So in this case, everything that we've been doing all semester in the background has been language. Every, I mean, your assignments were written down. The things I've said have been in words. So all semester has been language. So now let's bring it into the foreground and talk about it. And really the main thing we're gonna be doing is talking about how the nature of language comes up because well, what we're really interested in with our, oh my God, wait, I need to pause for a second. There are two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 15 people. This is a new, this is, this is mind boggling. This is a great moment for me. This is, you've more than doubled the last class. Thank you, Pamela. I mean, you told me to put it out into the universe and I did and it worked. And from now on, I'm going to always uh, put it out there. So anyway, um, that's what language, why we're talking about it in this class. So one thing to talk about with language, just generally speaking, there's an important background, uh, like background assumption, which we've been working with, but haven't actually talked about much. And this is the divide between language on the one hand and meanings on the other. And when we've been talking, oopsie, let's see if this works. This is my fun game. Somebody, we discovered, oh no, it's back. Uh, when you're talking, what we've been talking about all semester, we've been interested in the meanings of language. And the meanings of language of when I use a sentence, the meaning is the thing that I communicate to you or the thing that I get across. And these are the things we care about in class because meanings are things, the meaning of a sentence is something that can be true or can be false. And all semester we've been interested in finding out how to reach true conclusions and how to make sure that our premises together, true premises lead to true conclusions. So language is interesting and important to us because sentences of a language are the things that, or the main way we use to express the meanings that we're talking about. So for instance, um, here's a sentence and you all know what the meaning of this is. N-Y-C is, what something N-Y-C is? I don't know. Great. The best. Yeah, the best, or I'm just going to go with great because I don't feel like writing out more words. NYC is great. You all know what this means. And the meaning of this sentence, NYC is great, is like, what would it take for this to be true? Um, well, it's true if it's actually the case that New York is a great thing. Here's another one. New York is in California. Is this true? No, it's not true. I'm glad, or I hope you all know that you're not in California right now if you're in New York. So yeah, NYC is not in California. There's this thing, why is this? Well, the sentence expresses a meaning and the meaning is a false one. So this is why we care about language in this class. Now, the interesting thing about language and why we're gonna care about it is because while what we're interested in is the meanings, 
The fact that we talk in terms of language means that you can do tricky things over here with the meanings or with the language itself. And in so doing, get people to conclude meanings which they might not actually want to accept. So to think about it this way, in the last two few classes, what we've been looking about at is us drawing conclusions um, or thinking things are true for the wrong reasons. We, instead of reasoning in good ways, we're either influenced by our environment to think something is true, or alternatively, the way our own mind works tricks us into uh, thinking something tr is true when it's not. And one other way that you can be tricked into thinking something's true when it's not is because somebody is using language as the channel or the medium of getting that meaning across but the nature of the language itself as the thing that is carrying that meaning or getting across that meaning is something which can be manipulated to get someone to reach a meaning. And so one thing you can do with language is you can say one thing and get someone to think a meaning and have them think something that is slightly different than what you actually meant in a tricky or confusing or manipulative sort of way. And the reason why this is possible is just facts about the nature of language. So this is the back, like in the background. Um, that's just generally to think of language. Language is just a like a representational system or a way of expressing meanings in which you take little bitty parts, the words, you combine them together in accordance with certain rules to have larger meanings. And the nature of language is such that I can get you all to think things that have never been thought before. I can say new sentences that you've never under, like never even conceived of, and yet you're able to understand and grasp them. And so language is this incredibly powerful tool, but part of its nature also means that it can be manipulated and used in ways that because it can communicate meaning and because of the way it communicates meanings, it can be used in very, I guess a good way of putting it is sneaky sorts of ways or manipulative sorts of ways. So that's what we're going to talk about this class is just the ways in which the nature of language allows us to basically trick and be tricked by each other. Any questions at this point? Are we okay? All right, let me erase this. One last just background thing about language uh, that's going to be useful for understanding this first one. What's the basic unit when you're speaking? Most of the time you speak in, you don't generally make single word utterances. What do you usually express or what do you usually say out loud? What do we call the bunch of words stuck next to each other? Sentences? Yeah, sentences. Yeah, so what is a sentence? We've said it's the sort of thing that expresses something true or false, but basically you can think of it as combining two parts. Uh, one is the words that make it up, and each of those has their own individual meanings. And then you have two, which are syntactic rules, which tell you how to combine the words together into larger meanings. So because sentences have these two parts, both of them can be, um, they're both capable of being used in ways, you can manipulate both of them to make your meaning somewhat unclear or to try to get people to think something while at the same time hiding your true intentions, et cetera. Again, I'm talking very vaguely, but it'll make more sense with uh, a particular example. So what am I talking about here? Now we've talked about words and syntactic rules. So um, how do I want to frame this? The first way in which language can be used in a sneaky way is equivocation. What is equivocation? Anyone know? A mistake. Say that again. Is it a mistake? It is a mistake. It's a type of mistake. It's actually a type of fallacy. But what type, what particular sort of mistake or sort of fallacy is it? Well, equivocation is tied in with this other notion. So 
So as an, a noun ambiguity or as an adjective ambiguous, what does it mean for something to be ambiguous or what is ambiguity? It has like a double meaning. Yeah, what ambiguity means is it's something which can be interpreted in multiple ways. And what's presented to you is actually um, ambiguous between two different interpretations. So to take a classic example, uh, I'm, let's see if I can actually get this to work. Um, this is an ambiguous, if I've done this right, it's an ambiguous figure where it's ambiguous between like which is in the front and which is in the back. Depend if I were to do this right, which I'm not right now because it's a marker, generally you can see it either as this is the front panel or this is the front panel, depending on how you look at it. It works better in one where it's not drawn up. That's an ambiguous figure though. It has multiple interpretations. Any sort of illusion will often be a, uh, an ambiguous figure. Or, um, yeah, so that's all we mean by ambiguity. So what equivocation is, is when you, um, you intentionally draw upon the ambiguity of something in the case of an argument. And it's almost like a bait and switch. So you start with a word that looks a certain way and has one meaning, and then you substitute in a different meaning of it to draw your conclusion. So what am I talking about? Let's go with a particular example first. Um, here's an argument I'm gonna give you, which if you don't interpret, if you didn't know that th this word was um, ambiguous, this would look like a good argument. So let's go with premise one, Cardi, Cardi B is a star. Premise two, stars are flaming balls of hydrogen in the sky. Conclusion, Cardi B is a flaming ball of hydrogen gas in the sky. Is this a good argument? From this argument, should we conclude that Cardi B is a flaming ball of hydrogen in the sky? Well, if we know nothing about uh, what a star is. It, it could be. So, yes. uh, <laughs> I mean, how about you could inter like there might be a, some weirdo may have named some astronomer may have named a star Cardi B, but let's say let's fix on Cardi B, the female rapper from the Bronx, um, or is she from Northern Manhattan? I can never remember. Anyway, Cardi, the actual person, is this a good argument? Should I conclude that Cardi B is a flaming ball of hydrogen gas in the sky? No. Why not? What's the key word here? Um, because she's a person, I guess. Yeah, so the key here is I'm using star in two different ways. The first way I'm using in a metaphorical sense of like a movie star or a film star or a rap star. In the second sense, I'm using it in the literal astronomical sense of that's the definition of a star in astronomy. A star is a flaming ball of gas up in the sky somewhere. Like the sun is a star. Why? Because it's a big flaming ball of hydrogen. That's all it is to be a star in astronomy. However, the star in premise one is a different star than in premise two. Therefore, it's not a good argument. This is equivocation. You start with one meaning of star and move it to another meaning of star. So here would be another one. If I say, um, you know, banks are full of money. The Hudson River has two banks. Conclusion, the Hudson River has two things that are full 
of money. Is this a good argument? No. Why not? Where's the key again? It's, a, it's two different uh, meanings of banks. Yeah, bank has two meanings here. One is the side of a river. The other is a financial institution. They are different things. We just happen to use the same word for both of them. So if, you tr if somebody tries to convince you to go rob the side of the Hudson River because it's a bank, that is not a good thing to spend your time doing. The Hudson River Bank is a different sort of bank than the type where your money is. Don't rob the side of a river. You won't get any money. If you're going to rob something, make sure it's a financial institution. Um, so that is what we're talking about with uh, ambiguity. And this is ambiguity around words. So this was a case in which you have a very classic two words with that look the same, but have very different meanings. But you can also have some other cases. So um, you can have cases in which, uh, so he, let's go with another one. Um, very often these sorts of things are used in advertising. So um, how many people, you know, when cigarettes, when people started discovering that cigarettes were really bad for you, cigarette companies started making mild cigarettes. What is a mild cigarette? Is a mild cigarette good for you? No. No, it's not good for you. The mild here means mild for a cigarette. It's, it's less saying, deadly, probably. That's pardon? There. It's probably it's, just less deadly. That's it's less argument. deadly, but like in the same way that like stabbing yourself in the heart is less deadly than shooting yourself in the head. Both are going to kill you. It's just that one of them is slightly less likely to kill you you might get to the hospital in time. Mild cigarettes in the same way. They're trying to get you to think like, oh, this must be mild in general. It's mild for anything. However, it's just saying this is mild for a cigarette. In the same way, is a small elephant a small, like here's one, um, let's go with this. Uh, what's a good elephant name? Somebody give me a good name for an elephant. Dumbo. Dumbo. Dumbo is a, um, a small elephant. One, two, all elephants are animals. Conclusion, Dumbo is a small animal. Is this a good conclusion to draw? Dumbo's, if Dumbo's a small elephant, all elephants are animals, therefore Dumbo is a small animal. Yes, yes, it is, I think. Is this, if I, I mean. All confusing. So why, why isn't, so here's the question. This looks like a good argument. It looks like if Dumbo's a small elephant, he's gotta be a small animal. All right, give me an example of a small animal, an actual small animal. A dog. A, a dog. Animal. What a is even animal. smaller? An ant. An ant, a fly. What are some like medium-sized animals? I don't know, humans, horses. Horses are actually pretty big. So is du where does Dumbo fall on this scale? If Dumbo's a, an adult elephant, is he gonna be bigger than the horse? Yes. Yeah. Is he gonna be bigger than a human? Yeah. yeah. Is he gonna be bigger than a lion? Yes. Yeah. Yes, Dumbo is not a small animal. Dumbo is actually quite a large animal. He's just small for an elephant. So here's another way in which you need to be careful. Words like small, large, uh, powerful, they all have these sorts of, they all apply, they're all relative terms. You can do well, like, I'm doing well, well for what? Well for a human being, well for somebody who just got shot in the leg. Like what it counts to qualify as doing well changes from context to context. In the same way, d being a small elephant, being small, it depends on whether you're talking about elephants or like a small elephant is much larger than a big butterfly. Um, like a big butterfly is big for a butterfly. A small elephant is small for an elephant, but even the smallest elephant is bigger than the biggest butterfly. Uh, 
So these things are important because they can be used to manipulate you. So for instance, uh, a politician might say that we have like, we have the lowest crime rate. The lowest crime rate for what? We have the lowest crime rate of cities in which a million people have, or which a thousand people are murdered each year. We've got the lowest crime rate of cities in the United States. We've got the lowest crime rate anywhere in the world. We've got the lowest crime rate ever anytime. Each thing like that, ever or lowest or always be on the lookout because a politician will tell you how great things are or an ad will tell you we've got the, the best model we've ever had. Well, best for what? Um, new and improved. Like if my new and improved is another classic one of um, ambiguity, something like new or improved. Improved is always improved compared to something else. So if your machine was absolutely terrible before or your food product was so inedible, so disgusting that it was never eaten, then all it takes to count as new and improved is just be a little bit better than it was before. So these are the ways in which you hear these buzzwords and they can be used to manipulate you and get, your, um, get you to think something while also at the same time having a different meaning which is hidden in the background. So does everyone understand how being aware of the way that this is a sort of equivocation. They're trying to get you to think like improved in general, like this is new and improved compared to everything else. And I think this is why um, like ads are now obligated to um, include like, a, how, do you, uh, how do you call this? It's like a disclaimer. They have yeah. to include a disclaimer compared to this or in accordance to that. Yeah, and very often though, with these disclaimers, uh, it's usually said at the end of the commercial and very like writing and they're talking and like this and you're just like, well, I, I didn't pick up on that. We intentionally have to include it. But like, if you ever listen to a car ad, will there be like new deal, $2.99 for your first six months. And then the little bottom print will be like, if you qualify for six, blah, 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 blah. or in any sort of, um, health advertisement, new, improved, guaranteed to solve your problem. And then they say very quickly at the end, except if you fall in this category, this category, or this category. Um, so yeah, these are ways in which this is called equivocation. Now it's not just individual words that can have ambiguity in this sense. You can also have whole sentences which can be interpreted in different ways. So to illustrate this, I'm gonna give a kind of silly example. Um, yeah, battery's not included, Tandeep. That's a really good one. That's one in which like, or the product as displayed is not actually what you will receive or size not the same or whatever not included. Um, to show what I mean by syntactic ambiguity, I'm gonna compare two different um, passages. The first one will have no ambiguity. The second one will have ambiguity in a way that is actually like kind of funny. So here's the, here's the first one. Imagine you're on like Monster or is that even a thing anymore? LinkedIn, any sort of advertising uh, website that's looking for like advertising new position at, at say a high school. So you see this ad seeking high school biology teacher must be willing to discuss evolution with high school students versus, let's put this one in blue, seeking High school health teacher must So 
Um, can everyone read this? Is it clear? The first one has only one interpretation. The second one has two interpretations. See if you can get both interpretations of the second one to see what I mean by syntactic ambiguity. So what's the, is anyone picking up on what the two different meanings of the second one are? All right, so let's talk about the first one. Seeking high school biology teacher must be willing to discuss evolution with high school students. Here's the key phrase, with high school students. What is happening with high school students in the first passage? What is this person doing with the high school students? Teach them. Teaching, or in this particular case, what's the key word? Discuss. It, say that again. Discussing the evaluation. Yeah, the, discussing. the discussing is the word. So you can think discussing is happening. And what is being discussed? Evolution. Now, in this case, there's two meanings. In the same way, the key is with the discussing. Um, in this case, though, there are two different things which could be getting discussed. It's either that you are discussing and the topic of the discussion is sex with the high school students. You're talking about dis the discussion is with the high school students. The other less appropriate interpretation, which is why sometimes things like this make it into ads and end up being funny, which is what's the secondary interpretation? Well, it's that you're not having a discussion with the high school students. It's rather you're having a discussion about having sex with high school students. That would be the, inter the other interpretation that's there. And so very often, another one you'll see is cases in which um, you'll often see it in uh, like headlines in newspapers in which you'll see an ambiguity of this sort, this sort of syntactic ambiguity. Clearly they meant one sort of thing by their uh, headline, but there's a secondary reading. So something like, um, or another one is, uh, this is a classic one. I can't remember what it's from. Um, I shot an elephant in my pajamas. I have no idea how he fit into them. So the more natural interpretation is the first one is that you were wearing the pajamas when you shot the elephant. But the secondary interpretation is that the elephant was wearing the pajamas. So that is, this is what we mean by syntactic ambiguity. Syntactic ambiguity is when there's a sentence that can be interpreted in multiple ways based on the structure. And you can equivocate in these sorts of cases too. Um, somebody who wants to try to uh, hide their meaning might intend you to interpret it in one way, but then if you were to call them out on it, they'd say, no, 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 I meant it in the other way. Um, yeah, the New York Post is excellent at these sorts of things. Um, the New York Post, I mean, any sort of pun very often depends on uh, these sorts of equivocations between two meanings. And sometimes equivocation is used to make a funny joke. Um, but also it can be used in a less um, well-intentioned way. So uh, I'm trying to think, another, like another famous example is um, when what politicians will often do is they'll give something a narrow interpretation, but assume that you will take a broader interpretation. So for instance, in the famous impeachment trial of Bill Clinton, uh, when Bill Clinton was impeached, he was impeached for lying because what had happened was he and his aide, Monica Lewinsky, had engaged in oral sex. They asked him, have you had sexual relations with this woman? He said no. He said no because he gave a narrow interpretation where the only thing that counts as sexual relations is uh, full sexual intercourse, 
knowing full well that people would interpret him in this other way as also meaning uh, as meaning that he didn't touch, have any sort of sexual interaction with this person. So that's a case in which you can equivocate, where you can say something knowing full well that people are going to draw one conclusion, but in truth have another conclusion that you could fall back on and say, no, 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 I actually met something else. So when you're looking at ads, you can often see this sort of thing. Political speeches often see this sort of thing. Um, so does everyone understand what I mean by equivocation here and how it ties in? All right. Yeah. The next one I want to talk about is vagueness. What is it for something to be, or the adjective is vague? That's vague. What does it mean for something to be vague? Not clear. Not, not clear. Not clear. It's not. It's got kind of not it's specific. A broad meaning. Like it yeah, covers a, very, a lot of stuff, but it's not a narrow. Very broad, broad meaning. So, for instance, um, something is not vague if it has a very like 236 is not vague. It is very specific. To count as 236 items, there has to be a very specific number. What is something that's much vaguer that you could use to describe an amount? So if we're not talking like 236, what's another word I could say there, which would be more You can vague? say a lot. A lot is one. Where most Americans, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, most Americans. What counts as most or the majority or some Americans? Technically speaking, if only one person does it, somebody does it. Some people do it. So these are ways in which vagueness means, um, vagueness is a way of using a very broad meaning and by speaking very broadly, there's a lot of different things which could make what you've said is tr what you've said true. And it can be used manipulatively because very often vagueness carries with it these sorts of, um, very often our words tend to be interpreted or used most commonly in one way. So if I say some, I generally use that to mean like more than one. Like I'm not, if I say I have some dogs, like I usually am not trying to say I have one dog. I usually have at least like three or four dogs. And so because you know what I'm likely to interpret, but you also know that literally speaking in like a logic class, one thing counts as some, you can use this to manipulate people's expectations and say things and then cover your own butt by, you know, saying this. So Jeffrey says making polit politicians do this to make, they make a living doing this. Exactly right. People can do this sort of thing in a way that gives you a lot of advantages. Um, and if you get really good at talking vaguely, you should probably be a politician. Um, so um, very often, there's a lot of places where you can see vagueness in action. But um, if anyone has any, like, ideas that pop into their head off the bat, feel free. Otherwise, I'm going to look at my notes and see if I can uh, bring up some. Does anyone have any vagueness, like the way in which vagueness is used in an actual context that ends up being manipulative? Anyone have any examples that pop to mind? Are professors explaining exams? Yes. Professors explaining exams, I think, is a very good one. Why? Very often, I think what professors will try to do is, um, they don't yet, they haven't yet written, they have not yet written the exam or they don't want to make it, uh, or they don't want to have to um, change the grades around after they've already given them. So what they will do is say something along the lines of, all right, I understand, but I meant it in this other way, or it's written in such a vague way that the way you interpret it is not the way that they're grading it. So a good exam will be written in a way that is not vague, but very often professors, myself included, are guilty of vague questions. I mean, I'm guilty of them on the homeworks. What are some others uh, sorts of cases from advertising or politicians or anything else? Saying something like, uh, we will fix uh, so-and-so problem, but you, you don't say how you're gonna fix it. So yeah, we will fix it is a very vague way. Also, so let's actually look at this one because there's about three different vaguenesses in this particular example. So um, actually every word in here is vague. We will fix this. Or let's, let's just go with we will fix. So why do I say all of these are vague? 
Well, he implies there's certain people, but you're not saying who. You're not saying who. So who's going to fix it? Exactly. Well, if you say we're going to fix it, it makes it seem like you've got some particular set. Give me a second. I'm going to shut off the video and turn it back on. Hopefully I'm not blurry. Yeah. So we doesn't make it clear who's going to fix it. And so if you then come out and say, hey, politician, you said that you're like, hey, Obama, you said you were going to fix health care. And what he says in response is, well, I didn't literally mean my administration. I just meant the Democratic Party in the long term is going to fix health care. Another one is will. All it takes to um, count as will is just for it to happen at some point in the future. So if Trump says we will have a vaccine in for, for uh, COVID in weeks, well, technically speaking, every <laughs> amount of time can be broken. <laughs> yeah. So like strictly speaking, and just to be clear, this is not like Democrats are not the only ones guilty, Republicans are not, everybody does this stuff. Technically speaking, in the same way, if I were to email you and be like, hey, when are you going to turn in your homework? And you say, hey, I'm going to turn it in real soon. Don't worry. And then I ask you again a week later and you're like, yeah, yeah it's still soon. I'm like, soon would have meant like last week. You're like, oh, I'm sorry, professor. I meant in a cosmic scale. And in the history of the universe, the earth is, you know, it's been around for 6 billion years. So as long as I get it to you in the next 100,000 years, it's going to be soon in the way I meant. Like that's another case in which you are speaking vaguely. Also, what counts as fixing? Like, if one more person gets health care, does that count as fixing health care? A politician might argue, yes, it does. So this is another very nice, clear case in which vagueness can be used where you, knowing full well what people are going to interpret or what you Im imply is the case, knowing full well that if somebody calls you out on it, you can backtrack and say, no, 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 I gave it a different interpretation. That's not what I meant. Um, another good one tied in with this is, uh, you know, all natural. How many people have seen on a food product, all natural ingredients? Yeah, it's, I mean, most food products these days try to say it or like a new all natural experience or blah, 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 blah. But here's the thing, all natural sounds really good but it's incredibly vague what ingredients they're talking about. And honestly, there's a lot of natural ingredients. If somebody specified, you wouldn't want them in there. Like here's an all natural ingredient, babies. Babies are natural. Do you want ground baby in your burger? No, you don't, but technically speaking, it's all natural. Um, other things like, you know, horse pee is all natural. You don't want horse pee in your beverage. It would be much better to have a beverage full of lots of artificial ingredients, as long as one of them, an all natural beverage that has horse pee in it. So by saying all natural, somebody can make it seem like, oh, we've got a great, very often buzzwords. What I mean by buzzword is just like all natural, all new, new and improved. These are things which you see in advertisements, which because they're so vague, they make it seem like there's substance there and they can be very persuasive. Like if you see all natural, the word natural has positive feelings, all has positive feelings around it. So what you end up doing is thinking, well, if it's an all natural product, it must be good for me. Other things like diet Coke, diets are good for you, right? If you're dieting, you're gonna lose weight and be healthier, right? Well, does that mean diet Coke is good for you? No, fun fact, diet Coke is not good for you. Don't drink large amounts of Diet Coke. It's no, no better for you than regular Coke. Um, all this stuff is like, you know, a lot of anything's gonna be bad for you. So buzzwords, diet, all natural, uh, you know, anything like that is the case of vagueness. Also back to politicians doing this, one of the most classic places to look for um, vagueness is in political campaign slogans. So if we go with the last like two last two presidents, what were their political campaign slogans? Like their main- Make America president. great again? So MAGA is one. And what was Obama's? Uh, I don't remember. Hope. We have oh. hope and MAGA. What is more vague? Like, what are you hoping for? What is hope? Like, this could not be more vague as can make America great again. What is, in this case, much of the 
the vagueness isn't great. What counts as being great? Is America great if we have the, you know, most COVID cases? Is America great if we have the most people under the poverty line? Is America great if we bring agricultural jobs back and stop making soybeans overseas or whatnot? And so the thing about these vague, uh, the reason vague campaign slogans are so effective is that when people are voting for politicians, it's very emotional a lot of the times. You know, people get very up in arms about their political views. So people who already have positive feelings about a particular politician are generally going to interpret this very vague message in whatever way seems best to them. So if you're somebody who thinks that the worst thing that's been happening in the United States is that there's a lot of lost jobs in the Midwest, then to you, make America great again means bring jobs back to the mid manufacturing jobs back to the Midwest. If make America great again, if to you, the worst thing that the Obama administration did was create Obamacare, well then to you, making America great again means Obamacare is gonna go away. If you're somebody who thinks that uh, Roe v. Wade was the worst court decision ever and that um, abortion should be made illegal universally, then make America great again means that abortion is gonna be made illegal. That's how you interpret it. So that's with vague campaign messages, somebody's able to give the illusion that they have a concrete message. And also if you were to call them out, if you ask, like, if you ask Trump, have you made America great again? He's gonna be able to say like, yes, I did. I brought back X many jobs and until COVID hit, the economy was X, Y, and Z. So even if he didn't make America great in the way you thought he did, meant, he still could say, yes, I did. Same with Obama. Obama could say, yes, my message of hope was true. There was now hope that a person of color could become president. Even if to you, hope meant higher taxes on banks and that didn't happen, I still met my campaign promise of hope. I also provided hope to people by bringing Obamacare into existence. Was it as good of a method as I wanted it? No, but I succeeded. I brought hope. So that's what we're talking about with vagueness and how it can be used to um, manipulate people. Also, I generally find another good one. You can find things like this on uh, like Instagram. Anything after a hashtag is often very vague. And it's like somebody's trying to prove to you how great their life is by saying something like hashtag living my best life or something along those lines where like that has no meaning. That doesn't prove to me that anything is happening. Also inspirational quotes are very often so vague as to be meaningless. Mission statements by companies. How many of you have re ever read a company mission statement? They're like the things that they present to their shareholders. They're usually things along the lines of, our goal is to provide a supreme customer experience while maximizing the need or like the needs and values of our forming team. It's like, there's no, anything falls under that heading. And so you can, the key with like good vagueness is that People can think you have a substantive meaning when really you don't have any particular meaning in mind and know full well that you can always fall back and cover your own ass if somebody calls you out for it. That's and that's interesting because I work as a paralegal in a firm and for us, it's like backwards. We have all the information and we know exactly what we want, but our job is to make like the vaguest um, descriptions or the vaguest contracts that we can possibly think of just so like, if loopholes come, they, um, you know, they're beneficial to us and our clients. And so, yeah, so this is the key. And so, um, thank you. That's a great case. And very often, like, and this is where it pulls in opposite directions, where why is vagueness a thing? Well, because for very particular interests, you, like, if you are a lawyer or if you're writing a legal contract, you want it to be as vague as possible so that down the line, if something comes up, you can then point to the language and be like, no, 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 you see, we said that within a reasonable amount of time, this had to be disclosed in a reasonable amount of time. And so by keeping it vague, it gives a company more wiggle room. But on the flip side, when something's vague and part of the reason that mission statements in this are designed to be vague are exactly because they allow you for wiggle room on the other end. 
So the key is if you're trying to figure out what someone else means and you're trying to get to a single true fact, you don't want vagueness. If you have another method or another goal, then it can be very good to include vagueness. The, t the tension comes in when one person is thinking somebody's being not vague or being very specific while another person is intentionally being vague. So like part of the lawyer game is everybody is being vague and everyone knows everyone else is being vague. And so there's this game of like which vague language and each word has a very specific meaning. The problem is when somebody who doesn't know how to play that game, doesn't know the vague language game, starts interpreting it using their everyday interpretations. And so if you're somebody who reads one of these messages, like if you read a legal contract and it says in a reasonable amount of time, know that that language is intentionally vague. And so if you're a lawyer, it's going to be very good in this case. However, if you're somebody who's reading this, just and you're like, oh yeah, this, this lawyer said in a reasonable amount of time. To me, a reasonable amount of time means a day. Well, know that that's not necessarily what they mean. So always with vagueness, try to hammer down what the vague terms mean. Because part of the game of any job or any politician, any lawyer, any anything, is learning how to say things that are vague enough that nobody's going to be able to call you out on it. And this actually, Tandiv, also goes back to your professor one. Of very often professors don't want to have to talk to their chair when they do a bad job. So instead, they come up with a vague enough answer such that if a student were to go before the chair and be like, this professor said this, the professor could be like, no, this is so vague. Um, this is, I, they, I said, it will be returned in a reasonable amount of time. Six years is a reasonable amount of time in the grand scheme of things. So yeah. Thank you for bringing up that example with the lawyer of like why the flip side. And if you're a politician, like there's a reason why these things are so vague. There is a benefit to it from the other side. It's just if somebody's giving you a vague argument and if your goal is to try to find out what's best for you or what the truth is, be aware that vagueness can like kind of hide it or cloud it or prevent you from knowing exactly what the right, like you might think you know what they mean, but if their language is vague, they can get away with a different meaning. Um, all right. Any other questions on vagueness? I'm glad you brought up the lawyer case. That's a really good one. Any others? All right. The last thing I want to talk about then is euphemism. What is a euphemism? Has anyone seen this word before? I don't know if I'm spelling it right and I don't care. Euphemism. What a euphemism is, simply speaking, is it's a word that means the same thing as another word, but in some sense is less, uh, yeah, it's, Hong says, it's when you make something sound nicer. You're talking about something bad and you put it in terms that make the thing you're talking about sound nicer. So therefore, the goal here is instead of getting somebody, uh, like to have a strong emotional reaction. You put it in longer words or fluffier terminology so that somebody doesn't get up in arms or doesn't get very upset with you. So a classic case is um, if you want to, uh, I think, uh, what's the best way of doing this? Um, If somebody has just lost a loved one, what might you say to them? They're in a better place now. With time. Pardon? It gets better with time. It gets better with time. You're gonna say things, or you might say like, I'm so sorry for your loss, or uh, I'm so um, like, I'm sorry to hear about their passing. You don't say something along the lines of, yo, I'm sorry your dad died and is now rotting in the ground. Like, in a sense, that might be what's happening, but instead you use a euphemistic phrase. So things like passed away is a euphemism for died. We don't died or, um, you know, had a heart attack are generally less euphemistic. Instead, we say passed away or they moved on to a better place. Those are euphemisms. Now, what is the 
Why do we use euphemisms? Well, as the death case shows, very often we use them for very emotional sorts of issues. So instead of you want to, instead of for someone to think about the fact that their father died, you try to pull it back a little bit lower it, show that you care about their feelings and you want them to recognize that you aren't trying to hurt their feelings by bringing this up, you want to, et cetera, et cetera. However, the issue is very often the things that we get mad about are things we should get mad about. And euphemistic language can be used to hide the fact that something is bad or that something is a mistake has been made or something wrong has been done. So what are some classic euphemisms from like military or that you've heard politicians say? Anyone have any that pop to mind? Yeah, when Trump like downplays the virus and says like, it'll get better then something. I mean, I don't know his exact words, but something along those lines where like, he tries to like make light of a really dark situation. So yeah, so that's a, that's a sort of case. And I think the key is in this sort of case, isn't just playing it down. It's more that you use the terms to like very particular terms to highlight that it, or try to okay, highlight. I got, I got a better example for you actually, hold on. When he said uh, like, he's like, we're, we're around the bend about, would that be one? Yeah, around the bend is one. What does it mean? And around the bend also has some vagueness in there. Yeah. Around the bend means we're out of the first stage, but it makes it sound like we're now moved on and we're, we're going to go on. It's clear sailing from here when really all it means is just like we could we, we've got, we have gone around a bend. Things have shifted a little bit, but that doesn't mean we're in the clear. So that would be one. My own personal favorite one. Um, well, let's go with there's two good ones. Uh, tell me your your feelings about this phrase collateral damage and uh, enhanced interrogation techniques. How many, what, does anyone know what collateral damage refers to or how that phrase gets used? It's very often used in a military context. I think it is when someone dies as a uh... I guess they're in war and someone dies because of the war, something like that. Yeah. So they try to make it nicer. Yeah, it's a civilian death in war that was not intended and was not the goal, but it happened. So uh, you're, you're in charge of launching, say there's a drone attack, the drone misfires slightly and instead of hitting like a uh, enemy outpost, it instead blows up a hospital and a thousand children die. That's collateral damage. So this is a case in which the phrase collateral damage doesn't sound that terrible. You know what sounds a lot worse? A hundred children in a thousand pieces each. That's a way worse way. It sounds a lot worse. Or like when you read things about war, uh, it sounds terrible. Um, but if you use a phrase like collateral damage, it doesn't have the same emotional oomph behind it. And so politicians will say things like this, hoping that the, and as a matter of fact, the average person reading in the news about collateral damage gets a lot less worked up than if they read about a thousand children being blown up. Um, another case is uh, enhanced interrogation techniques. Anyone know what enhanced interrogation techniques are? Torture. Torture. Yeah. Enhanced interrogation techniques is CIA speech for torture. So this is causing immense amounts of pain to someone by putting their body through damage in the hope of getting them to say what you want them to say. So yeah, waterboarding. Also, even waterboarding is itself like kind of a euphemistic phrase. Uh, a better term for it would be getting tied down and being drowned repeatedly. Um, that's what waterboarding is. You literally fill someone's lungs with water and cause them to feel drowned. Like you're drowning them and then undrowning them and then drowning them. And then, yeah, that's what waterboarding is. Um, and so why do we have these euphemisms? Well, because if you describe it as enhanced interrogation techniques, people are far less likely to get upset or angry about it. So um, in Another word is just like the phrase side effect is like a vague euphemism. If a medicine has mild side effects, like that could mean that you have diarrhea for six days. Like that's not fun, but 
And this is one of the things in which medicines these days, they have to be more specific about it. And part of the reason why is because they have, uh, um, they've, they discover that advertisers will use euphemisms to try to cover this up. Also, um, another one, uh, how many people have seen the Cialis commercials? Do people know what these commercials are and what like the key tagline, which made them famous? Anyone remember these? I don't know if they're still on the, on the air. So the Cialis commercials were for an erectile dysfunction um, medicine. And what brought them into, uh, they were the first ones that really made it big by actually having to announce if you have an erection lasting more than four hours, go to the hospital. Until those, people would just say things like, can sometimes lead to unexpected results. Well, having an erection for four hours is an unexpected result, but saying an unexpected result is an incredibly euphemistic way of saying you have a major health issue that you need to get fixed or else your genitals might fall off. Like that is a much bigger deal. So this is what we're talking about euphem with euphemisms is the way in which the truth or the real substance of it can be hidden behind very vague or general language or very often big fancy sounding words that don't have the same sort of oomph behind it. Um, I'm trying to think, what are some other ones that I have on here? Um, anyone else have any euphemisms that they want to bring up? I had one, but then my mind just went. Um, it, basically what every company does after they mess something up and they release a, a, a press release or something to try to calm it down. Yeah, that is such a good one. Um, no one ever says something along the lines of, yeah, so-and-so was overworked and fell asleep at the job. It'll be things and like chopped off someone's hand. It'll instead be things along the lines of like, mistakes were made due to the increase of cuts consumer demand and are striving to reach it. Certain innocent mistakes were made along the way that led to some undesired outcomes. Any sort of PR speech is generally just pure euphemism. Uh, and so one thing to keep in mind with this is whenever you see someone, like be aware of what these terms, like what common euphemisms are. So you're actually aware of what they mean. Another one will be, you know, like uh, very often things in the news these days, uh, people do not very often individuals will not refer to things in the same way by one group that they would refer to it by another group. Instead, they will give euphemistic terms. So just like a matter of fact, very often um, in the like objective bad fact about the United States, if a large number of black people are gathered together in a grouping that is protesting something, it is far more likely to be called a riot or something like that than if a large number of white people get together. This is just a matter of fact, like a, a pathetic fact about the United States. And you can see these sorts of things. Like if um, another one is the way we use the word terrorist. Very often, if it's committed on American soil by an American, it is very rare, like, it very rarely gets called terrorism while the same sort of action carried out by somebody else is not terrorism. Another thing, like another case of uh, one is what's the difference between, here's two words that both get thrown around. What's the difference between a terrorist and a freedom fighter? Well, in some cases, there are differences, but in a lot of cases, these are just, I think I just went blurry. In a lot of cases, one person's terrorist is another person's freedom fighter, and it's just a matter of which side of the fence you're on. So just the way in which language can be used to change our perspective on things, and the way in which people can use seemingly nicer language to sneak by what's actually happening, um, and so very often be aware that if somebody's using one of these big fancy terms, what they're talking about might really be quite horrible, but they're not describing it to you. Um, and why aren't they? Because they have an agenda and part of their agenda is to, uh, 
make you not realize what it is that they're trying to get across. Um, I had one final example of this that is just completely out my, like went out the window. But um, these are the things to keep in mind and the way in which like a good argument, just because someone says, uh, and you can think about how this would be used in an actual context. If somebody's saying like, you know, there might be some mild collateral damage, but we're gonna have to deal with that. We need to send in the troops to solve this problem. As a matter of fact, people are more likely to agree to an operation that leads to a collateral damage than an operation that leads to large numbers of civilian deaths, even though they're the exact same thing. Oh, I remember what I was gonna say. Um, another one that is very euphemistic is just like the phrase domestic violence. Like while true, it is true, domestic violence applies to the term. There's, a, there's this thing in which, um, you know, the phrase covers up just how violent it very often is. And I think a classic case of this was, um, do people remember the Ray Rice NFL scandal? It must have been about five years ago at this point. Um, are people familiar with this story? He was an NFL running back who, yeah, he was an NFL running back. Basically, the NFL had heard from sources that there had been a domestic issue with him and his, and he committed domestic violence against his girlfriend. And the, like, this phrase was used, everyone knew it, it was out in the public. But all of a sudden, and he was in the league, nothing was happening, and then something suddenly shifted. And all of a sudden, he was kicked out of the league. What happened? What was the big thing that ended up happening that changed everyone's perspective? Like, we, everybody knew there had been a domestic violence issue. But something- was it a video? Yeah, a video came out. And why did the video make such a difference? Well, this is a classic case in which, like, the phrase domestic violence covered up just- how violent it was. And like, when you hear the phrase domestic violence, it doesn't force you to confront the image of what a 240 pound muscled ripped dude hitting a five foot two woman looks like. But when you see the video, you get beyond that. And this is a classic case in which the phrase can hide and allow you to avoid thinking about the real consequences or the real substance of what you're talking about. So very often, you have to remind yourself, like, just because somebody's using a euphemistic term, does this mean they're actually talking about something like that's not a big deal? Or these are just things to keep your eye out for in your everyday lives. All right. Um, so those were the three things I wanted to talk about. Basically, this whole semester, we've been talking about trying to find true things by using argumentation. And in the background, kind of we've been assuming the whole time without talking about it that language is involved in that. And because language is involved in that, there are ways in which language can be used in sneaky, manipulative ways. And the three to take away from this class are equivocation, where you use a, an ambiguous word intentionally in multiple ways to try to convince something, somebody of something. Vagueness can be used so that you commit yourself to less than what another person is going to interpret you as saying. And then finally, euphemisms, which are a way of using a less powerful word or a word that's less emotionally charged to get across your meaning, thereby sneaking by that what you're talking about is actually like a very morally problematic issue. All right, that's all I wanted to talk about for this class. Um, as I said at the beginning, homeworks are going to be getting back to you tomorrow morning um, because I did not get a chance to finish.